We have been in John 17 for a couple of months, though we've had a couple of weeks off here recently. We have worked through John 17, verses 1 through 5, and we have almost made it to the central prayer request in this prayer, which is found in verse 11. Do you remember what that request is? You're welcome to look at verse 11. What is the central prayer request? Two words. What is it? Keep them. Keep them. So, Lord willing, next Sunday we're going to get there, get to verse 11 into that request. But this week, I want to summarize the messages on verses 1 through 5, and then I want to look at verses 6 through 10 together. So let's pray, and then we'll think back to the beginning of our study here in John 17. Father, I thank you that we have had this time together this morning to um, try to use song to express to you the worship and thanks that you deserve from us. You would be, you are worthy of our worship and thanks if we, if we did this all week long, all day long, all week long. We wouldn't be overdoing what you deserve. So what we've given you this morning is, is just, a, just a little shadow of what you're worthy of but I do hope that by your work in our hearts, it is a genuine shadow. It is genuine praise, and I pray that you would continue to turn our hearts to you in such a way that we genuinely, in all of our weakness and struggles, genuinely do draw closer to you this morning by you taking your word and lifting up your son and drawing us to him. So we pray for you to do that work again this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember that this chapter is precious to us uh, because um, the, in, other than the just brief sayings that are recorded for us through the trial and, and crucifixion, uh, this is the last words of Jesus from his earthly ministry until after his resurrection. I mean, these are, were just hours before his arrest, trials, crucifixion. So that, that makes these words precious for us. They're also precious for us because... Um, This is a prayer, and uh, often Jesus prayed completely in private, right? He would go away by himself to pray, but here he he prayed out loud for his disciples to hear, and then it was recorded in the written word of Christ for disciples in all times and in all places to hear, including California in 2013. You know, we're supposed to hear this prayer. It's also, uh, compared to all the other prayers of Jesus that are recorded for us, it's the longest prayer. Uh, prayer of his. So uh, for many reasons, it's a, it's a chapter that's um, precious to us. And what, what has come to especially delight me in our study so far is just to realize that uh, in this chapter, Jesus seems to be overlooking the whole eternal work that he and his Father are accomplishing in the world. If you look at the end of verse 5, He refers to the glory which he had with the Father before the world was. And then down to verse 24, he's looking to the eternity future when he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. So can you see that Jesus is looking at everything from before this world existed, eternity past, into the future when his people will be with him forever. He's, he's overviewing the whole eternal work of the Father and the Son. He, and, and we get to listen in as he talks to the Father about that. Now, his first words to the Father in verse 1 are, Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. And this is explained for us in verse 4 when Jesus says, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So Jesus had come to the very end of his earthly ministry. And when he said, Father, the hour has come, he was saying he was reaching the end, accomplishing the mission of his coming to earth. So he says, Father, the hour has come. And then he prays, glorify your son. And verse 5 explains for us what that means. Now, Father, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So glorify your son here basically means bring me back home to the glory of heaven that I left when I came to earth. 
And then in the last phrase in verse 1, Jesus gives his goal, his purpose in that request, that the Son may glorify you. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus was finishing one work on earth that had glorified the Father, and he was beginning, he was eager to return to heaven and begin a new work on earth that was going to glorify the Father. And what's that work? Giving eternal life. That's what verse 2 tells us. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, so glorify that the Son may glorify you how? Well, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. That's the new work Jesus was going to do to glorify the Father. And this is still what Jesus is doing today. Remember again that the new age that began when Jesus returned to heaven, the Spirit was given at Pentecost. The new age is our age. We're still in it. That is, that is today. So Jesus was excited about you. Remember we talked about heaven's celebration and eternal life? Jesus was excited about you, excited about giving you eternal life, excited about working eternal life in other people through you and your testimony for him. Now, verse 2 also tells us why Jesus can give eternal life. It says, even as the Father gave him authority over all flesh. Now, as God, Jesus has, in a sense, always had authority over all flesh, but he has used his authority with different focuses at different times. You know, we talked about the Son of God at creation. We talk about the role of the Son of God with Israel under the Old Old Covenant. You can talk about the Son of God in his incarnation and how he used God's authority then. You can talk about the Son of God when he returns the second time and establishes justice and righteousness on the earth. You can talk about his authority then. So the Son of God doesn't always exercise his divine authority in the same way. And the focus of his authority today is the same thing, giving eternal life. That's the focus of his authority today. And so the focus today, we could say, as Ephesians 2 says, is building his church, or as Matthew 28, 20 tells us, Jesus has all authority, so go do what? Make disciples. That's where Jesus' authority is focused today. Then we, move into, we moved into verse 3, where Jesus explains eternal life for us. And we don't have time to go back through all that study. That was several messages. But first of all, remember, eternal life isn't just existing forever, because even people who don't have eternal life exist forever apart from God. The Bible puts eternal life and God's wrath as being opposites, because eternal life has to do with our relationship with God. It is having a relationship with God healed forever, fixed permanently. I loved, I'd never, I've sung that redeemed song that we sang this morning, I don't know, hundreds of times in my life, and it, I never grabbed that little phrase, his child, and forever I am. Not just his child, but forever his child, right? That's eternal life. When, when Jesus fixes our broken relationship with God, it is a permanent fix, We all enter this world as spiritually dead sinners with a very broken relationship with God and under his judgment. But Jesus Jesus took the spiritual death. Jesus took the judgment. And and when we turn from our sin to him and believe the gospel, it's like we're born a second time. You go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive because you're forgiven and that, that torn relationship with God is healed forever. That is eternal life. And so it makes sense when Jesus says that this is eternal life, that they might know you. It's about your relationship with God. And we talked about how really the the whole process of salvation is a process of coming to know God. We began not even knowing basic truths about Him, just being ignorant at a foundational level level about what God is really like. And, and, And we ignore what we do know. We don't like what we do know about God. But then he, through the word of Christ, God opens our eyes to both our sin and his glory, and we end up knowing him in a family relationship of love. Eternal life is knowing God. And we said that as we come to know him, uh, it's not just a, you know, a knowing of your head, it's not just a knowing of facts, but you come to value him, to desire him, to, to love him more than we love our sin. And we want to keep growing to know him better and better. It's not like learning to ride a bike where you know him and you're done. And ultimately, we treasure him so much that what we really want is to just to be with him forever. 
We don't want to have to walk by faith anymore. We want to see him and be with him forever. And what's amazing in John 17 is to read that Jesus wants the same thing. I mean, it's, it's no surprise that we want to be with him forever, but that he wants to be with us forever is rather surprising. But that's what he prays for in verse 24. I pray that they may be with me where I am. Right. And we learn too that part of that is the, the physical part of eternal life. Eternal life is primarily spiritual and it begins now, but it does have this physical consequence later on when uh, this body is changed into a perfect resurrection body. You'll be with Jesus forever, not just as a floating soul, but as soul and body in a new body like his. Then we, we kind of backed up and we said, now it's not just that eternal life changes your life forever though, it's that eternal life changes your life now. Uh, it, when, when you come to know and love God, you become a God worshiper. You become a God glorifier and he's honored through you because you know he's great and, 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 and you love that and you read your Bible because you want to learn more about that and you, and you let him convict you of sin and you humbly change because you want to be more like him and you gather each week with other people to praise him and you go out in the community and you tell people about how great he is. Eternal life changes you into a God glorifier. And remember, we talked about 1 Corinthians 15, 34, become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame, Paul says. All right, so that was all part of that study of the idea of eternal life as knowing God. And then in our last message three weeks ago, we talked about how in verse 3, Jesus makes it clear that knowing God is not just knowing any God, not just making up an idea of who God might be, but it is knowing the only God, the true God, and Jesus Christ, the one whom he has sent. All right, that was verses one through five in 10 minutes. Now we want to read through them one more time, okay? Try to bring together some of those thoughts. Let's read verses one through five one more time. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. <clears throat> All right. The rest of our time this morning, we want to look at verses 6 through 10. We're going to read those verses now. I want to ask you to watch for two things as we read verses 6 through 10. First of all, watch for any prayer requests in these verses. And then second of all, who is Jesus talking about or thinking about in these verses? So let's read verses 6 through 10 now. So Jesus says to the Father, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they receive them. <coughs> Sorry and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. All right. I don't think there are any prayer requests there. It's all leading up to verse 11 and the one main prayer request. But who is Jesus talking about in those verses? And I think the best, we could say the disciples, I think it's most helpful maybe if we say at this point in the story, let's say Jesus is talking about the apostles. That's who these men will very shortly become. And they will form what Ephesians 2 tells us is the foundation of the church. They will receive special giftedness from the Lord. There will be signs of the Spirit that particularly testify to their role as apostles, and some of them will be writers of our New Testament scriptures. So this will become a very important group of men, and here Jesus speaks to the Father particularly 
about them. So uh, just one rabbit trail for just a moment here before we talk more about that. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but you know, we, we make prayer lists for ourselves, at least probably many of you do, and you put it into categories. You know, we pray for ourselves and we pray for our family and we pray for our church family, and then I break that up by day of the week within, you know, my big categories uh, to try to keep track of it all and make it manageable. Um, and so it's tempting when we look at this prayer of Jesus in John 17 to think he's doing the same thing, like Jesus had his categories. What shall I pray for myself? And now what shall I pray for the disciples? And now what shall I pray for everybody else? <laughs> but that is not at all, at all what is going on here. Remember that Jesus is at an overlook, looking out over the eternal plans of Father and Son. And he is considering the accomplishment of one monumental step in that plan, his coming to earth. And so he's looking forward then to the commencement of the next step in that plan. So his prayer begins with a request for his own exaltation to heaven. That's the end of this first monumental step. And then he prays for the apostles because that's the foundation of the church that's going to be laid. But then through them, many others are going to become disciples. And so what he prays for the apostles really applies to all those followers of Jesus that will follow. So really, it's just a flow of prayer as Jesus looks forward to what's coming next. It's not like categories in a prayer list. And I, I, I don't know. It's probably not that big a deal. It just, I get frustrated when I hear people say like, Jesus only prayed a little bit for himself and he prayed more for the disciples and he prayed even more for all of us. That's, that's not at all what's going on here. Jesus is praying for what he and the Father are doing in the world. And that's the flow of what he prays. All right. So now let's look at these verses together. Jesus is talking to the Father about the apostles and specifically about what has been accomplished with the apostles. So I want us to actually read it again. And this time I want you to ask you to watch for how many times we have past tense words for things that already have been accomplished, all right? So back to verse 6. I have manifested your name to, to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. So you see that a lot of things have happened with the apostles, and that's part of the reason why verse 5 could happen. Jesus can return to the Father now because the apostles had been prepared. Jesus had accomplished that work. So verses 6 through 10 are about the preparation of the apostles. Why do we care about the apostles? Well, because from them came the popes. (laughs) No. One of the reasons is because our New Testament scriptures are primarily from them. I think in that way, they laid the foundation for the church. Um, It's their testimony to us, but also because as the church, the apostles are kind of like our, spiritually like our great, great, great grandparents, you know? Um, This is our genealogy, spiritually. This is our family history. This is our spiritual ancestors. As we as we drove to our, my family reunion a couple weeks ago, we were reading through some of the memoirs that my mom and grandma have written about our family. And sometimes as we read that, Crystal would say, oh, that's why you're like that. <laughs> right? So spiritually speaking, these apostles are the trunk of our family tree in the church. And I think we might discover some family resemblances as we as we look at this this morning. So three simple questions from verses 6 through 10. First of all, how, <clears throat> how did Jesus prepare the apostles to be the foundation of the church? How did he prepare the apostles? We find two answers here. First of all, in verse 6, he says to the Father, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. God's name is his character. It is who he is. And so as we've talked about so often, Jesus came to display the greatness of God, to manifest God's name. 
He did that in many ways, though the cross and resurrection combined to form the ultimate display of God's greatness. So through Jesus, the apostles came to believe that God is great. Jesus accomplished his mission of manifesting God's name to them. Then verse 8 gives us the second way in which Jesus prepared the apostles. Jesus says, for the words which you gave me, I have given to them. So Jesus manifested God's name and he gave them God's words. And again, we've, we've talked about this so much already in John 14 through 17, about the word and the spirit and about how by the spirit, the word of Christ made it from Jerusalem to Menifee, California. Had Jesus not brought God's word to the apostles, we would not have God's word today, at least in the New Testament scriptures. So Jesus prepared the apostles by manifesting God's name to them and bringing God's word to give to them. And just to be very practical about that, I know this is really obvious, but those two things are the same two things that every person needs. They need to know God's greatness and they need to have God's word. Or we could say they need to know God's greatness through God's word. That's what everybody needs. Eternal life is knowing God. And the words that Jesus gave are spirit and are life. It's through the words of Christ that you know God and have eternal life. To have his word and to know him and his greatness is to truly live. So did you invest yourself this week in knowing God's greatness through God's word? Now, that's what followers of Jesus do. So how did Jesus prepare the apostles? Manifested God's name, brought God's word. Second question how did the apostles respond? Again, we have two pretty simple answers. First, at the end of verse 6, what did they do with God's Word? They kept it. They have kept God's Word. Or as verse 8 says, they received and truly understood the words of God. They were good. Their hearts were good soil, and when the seed landed, it produced a crop. They, they listened. They understood. They, they held on to the Word of Christ. All right, that's the first way they responded. And then the second part of the response is in verses 7 and 8. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. So everything Jesus had was from the Father. Verse 8, for the words which you gave me I have given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. Okay, so they... The second way they responded was by believing that Jesus was truly from God. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, for a Jew, that was no small matter. That's why in the Gospel of John, we read more than 40 times that Jesus referred to being sent by the Father. To believe that was to accept His claims. To believe that was to accept Him as Messiah. And even beyond that, it was even to accept His deity. You see in verse 10, He says to the Father, All things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine. Do created beings say that to God? All that's yours is mine, and everything that's mine is yours. Really? And so the apostles came to believe that the Father and the Son truly were one. So they responded by receiving and keeping the word and believing that Jesus truly was sent from God. And again, just to be very simple, What our spiritual ancestors did 2,000 years ago is just what we need to do today. As followers of Jesus, we should be characterized by hearing God's word, understanding it, holding on to it tightly, and then celebrating the greatness of God, the greatness of the Father and the Son. All right, now our final question. What was Jesus' perspective on them? Now, if you hadn't read the verses yet, wouldn't you say that's an interesting question? How did Jesus view the apostles? It had been a pretty interesting few years together, hadn't it? So you come to the end of that, and now Jesus is going to talk to the Father about them, and what is he going to say? How did Jesus view them? So first of all, we see here that he viewed them as the fathers. See in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. And then the last words of verse 9, they are yours yours. So Jesus viewed the apostles as belonging to the Father. You can see that the Father is right at the center of these verses, right? 
and especially the Father's ownership, the Father's name, the Father's people, the Father's word, the Son whom the Father sent. And so Jesus viewed the apostles as belonging to the Father. They were His. We would do well when we look at other Christians to see them as belonging to God. We might be a lot less critical. We might look at other Christians a lot more positively if we could see their God when we look at them. The God who loves them, who chose them, who called them, who rescued them and owns them and made them a new creation and gifted them and is shepherding them today. Would we still hold grudges? Would we still remember what that person said two years ago that they shouldn't have said to me? Would we still be as willing to grumble? Would we make such a big deal out of their weaknesses if we saw their God instead of just seeing them? Maybe we could say it this way. Immaturity looks at a person and sees that person only. Maturity looks at a person and sees that person's God. And that is practical for our church right now as we consider deacon nominations. What do you see when you think about the men in our church? We have some weaknesses. Not one of us is remotely close to sinless. You've probably noticed. We have personality quirks. We've got physical quirks. We have a lot less wisdom than we should have. And maybe sometimes you've seen us do unwise things. We have pride though we cover that well, we think. We have ignorance. We fall to the fear of man far too often. And in this deacon nomination process, you could get caught up in seeing all of our men's problems and weaknesses. This could really be a problem for you. You could make your little grumble list about all the guys in our church. I don't think you're going to do that, but it could happen. And so I, as one of the men in our church, would ask you to please not lose sight of our God and what He is doing in us and what He could do through us. So let us, like Jesus, look at other Christians and see not just them in their weakness, but them in their God. See their Father who owns them. So Jesus viewed the apostles first as the fathers. Then, secondly, Jesus also viewed them as... Did you see it there in those phrases? Not only as the Father's, but also as His own. A gift from the Father. As He said at the end of verse 6, they were yours and you gave them to me. The Father's gift to the Son. Do you have some things in your life that are precious to you, not because they are intrinsically precious, but because of the person who gave them to you? These apostles were precious to Jesus because the Father gave them to him, but they were apostles. That's different from us. You're not going to fall for that, are you? Jesus said it in John 6. He said it about all of us. Everybody who believes in Jesus is a gift of the Father to the Son. The Father gave them to him. That's all of us. We are all precious to him because the Father gave us to the Son. So Jesus viewed these apostles as the fathers and then as his own. And then finally, he viewed them as, and this is probably poor English, but he viewed them as glorifiers. Someday, after they had received the Spirit, after they had grown up and matured, after they got over that selfishness and foolishness that we see manifested in their lives as disciples, after they got over their doubts, when they became bold and courageous preachers of the truth, when many of them would die for him, someday they would be glorifiers, right? True, but not what Jesus said in this passage. Not what Jesus said. You see it at the end of verse 10? I have been glorified in them. What? A few months ago, we talked about weak faith. 
and how even our weak faith is genuine faith that honors God. And we see that here in these verses as Jesus says that these waffling, doubting, struggling disciples had truly believed, and then at the end of verse 10, they had been truly glorifying Him. Whoa. Now, it is true that they would glorify Him more in the days to come as their faith and obedience and Christ-likeness grew. They, they were, there were God-glorifying days ahead, but there were also many God-glorifying days behind. Jesus had been glorified by these men. Now, that is very encouraging. Maybe God is glorified by more things in our lives than we realize. Now, let me, let me back up and give us a little um, context before we come back to that, all right? First of all, we could truthfully say that in many ways, we don't have the faintest idea how bad we really are. Don't have the faintest idea. <clears throat> how little we glorify God how incredibly far short we fall of the glory of God and how great a Savior Jesus must really be. Just consider how much thanks did God deserve from me this week. We're just talking about what He was worthy of from me. How much thanks? Okay, how much thanks did God get from me this week? Whew. How often was I covetous instead of satisfied in Him? I... I thought this week a couple times, you know, it's like I have this utopia in my mind of what my life would be like in a perfect world, you know, where no one around me sins and causes me any problems and I'm always comfortable and happy and I have everything I want. And it's like I live pursuing this little utopia. You all do the same thing, I know. Right? We all have an idea of what the perfect little life would be with no problems and everything great and us having everything we want. That is an insult to God. God is my utopia. God is all that I was created for and desire. But I still have this little world of things that I think would happen and would make me, make me happy. How often was I selfish instead of like Jesus? How often was I drawn to idols of the world that are really, at the end of the day, they're blasphemous. I mean, they're just, they're, they're nasty before God. And yet my heart was drawn toward those things. How, how infrequently did I even begin to obey the one command that matters? I mean, this is not hard, folks. There's just one command. Just love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Well, how did I do with the one? Forget all the rest. How miserably did I obey the one? I don't think I have the faintest idea how bad I really am. As Jesus said to the Laodiceans, you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You don't know it. So, we can truthfully say that we don't realize how bad we really are. And when we, when we stand at the judgment day, when we see Jesus, one of the reasons we will at that point realize far more greatly than we have ever realized how great Jesus is is because at that point, we'll finally see how great of sinners we really are. Yet, at the same time, we are redeemed sinners who are being changed by His grace. And maybe God is glorified by more things in our lives than we realize. A few months ago, I was reading J.C. Ryle's commentary on these verses in John. This was back when I was doing just the original prep work on this chapter. And I came across a line that just jumped off the page, and I wish you could, I could give it to all, to all in context to you, but here's the sentence. He said, believers make a better appearance in heaven than they do upon earth. And man, that grabbed my attention because we can tend to think, and there is truth to this statement, that if we really saw ourselves as God does, it would be awful. And there's truth to that, like I just said. But there is another sense in which Ryle is correct that believers make a better appearance in heaven than they do upon earth. In other words, God may be glorified by more things in our lives than we realize. Heaven might rejoice 
in more things than we realize. I'm going to guess that maybe someone here made a feeble little attempt to read your Bible this morning. It was too early, and your coffee had not yet kicked in, and your thoughts were very foggy, and you couldn't remember what you were supposed to be reading, and your brain didn't get in gear with what you did read, and you gave up and went to the shower. Now, maybe that didn't happen for any of you this morning, but I, it's a pretty good guess that for somebody, you had something like that happen this morning. Is it possible that what looked kind of pathetic from Earth's standpoint, heaven rejoiced in because you got up and tried? All that laundry you folded this week, which managed to, again, be completely unnoticed by the people who wear those clothes? (laughs) They didn't notice, but maybe heaven noticed. I've been thinking a lot recently about crummy prayers. Crummy prayers. I think you heard me talk about this a couple weeks ago. I don't remember, but how about those crummy prayers you prayed this week? Ugly little prayers where you wonder if you're just griping more than praying how did heaven view those prayers? Maybe, maybe God was truly glorified because you were willing to blurt out crummy little prayers when you were struggling. What about that attempt you made? You were going to share a verse with a coworker after work, but then her phone rang right when you were just ready to get started, and then next thing you know, she's gone, and it didn't happen. So from Earth's standpoint, that was nothing, right? Maybe heaven saw something different. Maybe God was glorified because you wanted to say something about Jesus. Maybe you chose to do it with honor God, even though you knew your classmates wouldn't think you were quite so cool. Maybe you tried to take a step to show your love for your spouse, even though he or she was being sharp, stubborn, jerk. Maybe you picked up your Bible story book and tried to read to your kids even though you were exhausted. Maybe you, maybe you kept listening to the blessing that your Christian friend wanted to share with you even though you're quite sure it's the third time they've told you that story. Now see, you didn't win any awards for any of those things here on earth. I mean, No one here at church even knows about those things. But maybe heaven rejoiced. Maybe Jesus said, I have been glorified in you. Maybe believers do make a better appearance in heaven than they do upon earth. This does not mean that we should be content with only crummy prayers and empty Bible reading and witnessing attempts that never really get started. But it does mean that we shouldn't spend so much time waiting for the someday when we're going to be really mature Christians who glorify God. Stop waiting for that someday and be a weak, struggling Christian today who keeps on pressing forward crying out to Him, taking three steps forward and 2.9 steps back? What doesn't look very pretty here on earth might look a lot better than you think from the viewpoint of the Father and Son who love you. Keep running the race that is set before you one plodding, sweaty, painful step at a time. Don't quit. Don't despair. God is glorified by plodding, sweaty, painful steps, every one of them. That's how Jesus saw these apostles. That's how Jesus sees us. And then he prayed, now, Father, you have to keep them. Okay, that's where we're headed next Sunday. Pastor, could you maybe come to the keyboard for us? I want to give you just a couple minutes to talk to the Lord. Maybe you have been 
believing that idea that someday you're going to be a mature Christian who gets your act together and starts glorifying God. And you need to just talk to the Lord now and say, okay, God, I'm going to quit living that dream someday and start taking the next ugly step today. And maybe you've just quit and you've been so discouraged and disheartened about yourself that you need to come back to him and say, dear Jesus, I think I'm a complete mess, but I'm going to believe that you can be glorified in my mess today. All right, so would you pray for us? I'm going to let you pray for just a couple minutes and then I'll close it.